Um, we are having a quiz over Asia on Thursday, and then we're going to start doing some early medieval. There is, I think, one piece of artwork in early medieval. So it, that will be very easy for us to cover in one, you know, half a class period. Um, so, oop, there we go. Um, let me let her in. Um, so, if you have any questions before now and Thursday, feel free to email me your questions on Asia, okay? Um, so today we're going to be looking at two sections of the study guide. One of them just has one artwork in it, and so we'll do that really quickly. And that will be focusing on Japanese images of war and violence. And then we'll finish with looking at man in the natural world. So it's actually kind of interesting. We have one very like violent piece and the rest is all about calm and peace. So a little bit opposites there. Okay, so let me make sure here. Yep, we're good. Okay, so we're focusing with the violence imagery um, in the high-end um, period. And this is an area that is around what we know of today as Kyoto. And um, this area was um, kind of ruled by a, you know, it was ruled by an emperor. Um, and the court had a lot of power. And what we start to see during this time in Japan is that territories started being kind of um, uh, fought over by these different kind of like courts as well as like shoguns. And so we have like the rise of the shoguns during this time. And so um, there's a lot of infighting. And so a lot of the emperors didn't have extreme, like a lot of the power. It became kind of these regional operators that had a lot of the wealth and the power during the day. And so um, the artwork that we're going to be looking at is part of the Genji and the Terra. Um, and so there's this series of wars. And so honestly, I don't think you need to know everything about Japanese history in order to understand. We'll really just focus on what is illustrated in the artwork that we have in our um, image set. So um, the Minamotos or the Jinji were a military clan, right? So that makes sense for why this image um, that we're gonna be looking at is based on war and violence. And so um, this Genpei War was where um, this clan defeated the, the Terra. Okay, so this really is just talking about um, how we have kind of this rise of these powerful shoguns, right? Um, and so just keeping in mind that these were basically provincial landowners who basically, you know, were kind of like all powerful. They, you know, had a military themselves rather than it being dictated by the like central power of the emperor. And they really like took care of their own people. So it's almost like what we see like the feudal system taking place in, um, in like in um, Europe, right? Where there would be like a, like a ruling power and their armies would take care of the locals. Okay. So let's go ahead. I'm going to skip through here. What we have in Japan is a painting tradition um, that does have some similarities to um, what we saw in China. And so we have um, the Yamato style, which is often used for um, native scenes and native literature. And there are two different styles of it. Um, of, of painting, I should say. One is called the women's style. And the woman's style tends to be very delicate. Um, the line work is very soft and clean. The colors are often very muted. And um, it has what we call invisible walls, which basically is um, like I showed when we looked at some Islamic manuscript painting. It's as if you, um, are watching a television show and you're looking inside someone's home, that fourth wall has disappeared so that you can see inside into that structure. The other style of Yamato is men's style. And men's style tends to have really strong line work and lively brush stroke. 
And this one doesn't have an example of it, but often the color is really, really bold. So we have one Japanese painting to look at, and it happens to be in a maki. And a maki is a Japanese hand scroll. So ours is the night attack of the Sanjo Palace. So this is from a Kamakura period, which is slightly after the Heian period that we just looked at. So we have a very, very long, skinny hand roll, which is kind of like, I shouldn't even say the whole thing. It is a part of the whole thing. This thing actually was made in multiple sections. And so this is just one section of an epic story. And then they give us one close up. And I think it's really interesting what they, cho they chose <clears throat> the end of it. So the very end of it is the close up that they have rather than all of the really fabulous painting that's part of the inner part of it. Okay, so by looking at a close up of this image, do you think it is in the male style or the female style? Go ahead and write it in the chat. Based on what we just saw, what do you think? Male or female style? All right, so we got a lot of the male style. We will see some female style components to it as well. It does have that kind of fourth wall idea of like, you know, looking inside of a structure, but it definitely has more characteristics of that male style with the bold color and um, bold brushwork. Okay, so when you look at a scroll, we saw this with um, Chinese art as well. Um, how are you supposed to view it, right? How are you supposed to view it? How are you supposed to um, enjoy it, right? You are not going to be taking in the whole thing at once, right? You're gonna be basically opening it up and looking at it section by section. So you'll just look at small parts of it. It's almost like a, a movie, right? Where you would just kind of like see it. Now, which direction do you think based on the activity that we see going on? right? Um, this is as big as I can make it, right? Where do you think you're supposed to look first? Do you think you need to look on the left or the right first? What do you think? You can turn on your audio if you want, or you can throw it in the chat. Oh. Holy moly, sorry. Hit the chat and then it disappeared. Right, so you start on the right side, very good. And so, on the right side here, we have text. Now, as we've seen a lot of painting, like manuscript painting and whatnot, what do you think the text is about? What would the text be about? You can turn on your audio, it's fine. What do you think the text is for? When we have a book or a story, right? What does it do? It's the, the, it's the actual written portion of the story, right? So it's gonna tell us what is taking place in the illustration that is sandwiched between these two elements of the story. So the part that we have here on the right is basically going to tell us what's taking place in this entire scene. Right? And then there is some more writing on the left side, which is our close up image. And that's basically going to tell us what's coming up in the next scene. Right? So it's like foretelling what's going to happen in the next set of paintings. Now, there's a link here with an interactive site that you're welcome to go to to look at it up close and be able to see different sections and different parts of this. I did, of course, do some close-ups for you guys, right? So this is designed for you to look um, from right to left and you have a bird's eye view. So bird's eye view is you're looking up high and looking down at the story, right? Rather than being at eye level, 
right? You're not standing. You're like a bird floating in the sky looking down at the scene. If you want to see um, a translation of part of the story, you can see it at the very bottom of Smart History, right? So the story being told. This, right, this is the content. This is like the general parts of it, which honestly, I think is what is going to happen here because there's so much activity taking place on this. AP is not going to ask you section by section because in all honesty, if they give you the whole image, you're never going to be able to see it, right? And they're so interested in that visual evidence, right? So for this painting, for the content, I would focus on how this is the siege of the Sanjo Palace, right? It's in the name. And this depicts the civil war of the Haiji Rebellion between the Minamotos and the Terra, right? And this is where Terra warriors abduct the emperor, right? And so actually they, they um, try to abduct the retired emperor, right, to exert their power, they're going to take this former emperor and they're going to kidnap him and take him from his palace. Okay, so that's the content of this entire scroll. So we're going to get to see all the action. So when we look at it and we look at this top image, we're going to see a close up. So like when we, we have the text, right, we have a cart and then there's all this activity taking place. This is the Terra coming into the palace. And from here, we see the warriors on horseback. We see their bows and arrows. We see their armor. And so it tells us a lot about what warfare was like during this period. It tells us um, that they were well prepared, that they were wealthy. You know, the fact that there's so many horses actually shows the wealth of these um, shogun. And then um, as you look around it um, as a whole, you see that there's elements of color in like the most important area. So like the flash and the fire um, that has been caused by the Terra in the, um, in the uh, palace. Right, so here it is kind of bisected for you, right? We'll continue to kind of dissect it here, right? So here's the introduction. So we have all that text and then we can see it's kind of starts off kind of quiet. There's not a lot of background. We have the cart and the cart is what they're going to use to take the emperor. So because he's retired, he's older, they're not going to throw him on the horseback. Instead, they're going to throw him in a cart and leave with him. Right? So the intro is very calm and orderly. Then the move changes, right? So we have that very bit beginning of the intro. And then what's happening all here, right? What's happening here? How does the mood change? Keeping in mind the terror are kind of the losers here, eventually, right? They're going to be the losers. It becomes very chaotic and very violent. Thank you, Jasmine. And a little disorderly in a way, too, doesn't it? Look at, um, they're kind of like running in chaos. Notice the cart is repeated over and over again. So this is not multiple carts. This is the same cart. Um, actually, maybe it's not the same cart. I take it back. It's not because I see different horses pulling it because here there's like a white gray horse and then here there's a black one. But the cart itself has some insignia on it and it is repeated. At least I see it three times in this scene, right? So because it's repeated, this tells us that it's a continual narration right? We've seen that vocabulary before. So keep in mind that AP loves to show you artworks from different cultures or different time periods that they can compare and contrast. So like we've seen it like the Vienna Genesis, which was a continual narration, or the um, column of Trajan, right? So here we have the samurai band moving in, and it really does hit like a crescendo. We see this animated passion as they move to the walls of the city, or the palace, I should say, right? So then 
after that, we get to the walls of the palace. And here we can see the roof line of the palace. We can see women fleeing for their lives. Um, you can see little people, uh, little, little like different people from the palace kind of like hiding and kind of um, um, trying to get away from the invaders. And you also have that fire, that billowy fire that um, is very animated. And, and obviously the color is really vivid too. And this is done with ink and color on paper. So that's all um, colored inks, right? So we already talked about being a continual narration. Here you'll notice that the cart once again, right, is here and then it's going into the palace again. So we have it repeated. But we also have the main characters. So the, the and I'm not gonna even pretend to pronounce their names, but we have the ex um, emperor, the former emperor repeated. We have Minamoto, we have the Terra general. These are some main characters that are repeated over and over and over again, as well as that ox cart. So, this is a good um, example of how this is a bird's eye view, right? You can see that we're looking up from above, looking down, because you can see the top of the roofs and you can see like the tops of the details of the horsemen, right? So here you can see, this is kind of moving off to um, that palace wall. Here you can see the women fleeing a little bit more carefully um, or a little bit more clearly, I should say. It still looks a little bit uh, pixelated, um, but you can see a lot of detail. So this is a little bit of elements of that female style. The fabric is billowy, the, the style is flowy of the hair. Um, so we see a blending of this male and female style together. Um, and then um, you also can see um, other grisly sort of things on this side. Um, there are some decapitated heads on pikes and um, with the warriors who are like flowing through the scene. There's the women. I don't think I circled the heads though. Oh, I did. Oh my goodness. <laughs> my husband's laughing at me from the distance. And then, right, we have the exit from the palace. So now we have the emperor inside of the cart, and you see them fleeing in a big mob as they leave the wreckage of the palace. And so it kind of ends in a calm fashion, you know, on that very far left side. So that's what our close up is. So our close up is probably the most boring section of the entire painting. Right. So thinking about what this is for, this is, you know, one, it's a hand scroll. Right. And so this is telling us what the next hand scroll is going to be about. So it's a lot less text than what we had on the right side. So here you can see those two styles together. Right. Here, this is a close up of the palace. So underneath those palace roofs that we saw, if you look really carefully, there's a porch. And so you actually can see the, war the Terra warriors coming in and you can see all this muscular definition, but notice how the colors are kind of muted, right? And that's kind of part of that female style. But then in other elements of it, we have that bolder color. And then of course the bold colors that are in the fire. Right. So typically in Japanese painting, um, colors, at least from this time period, are rather flat. Right. The colors tend to be flat and what we call linear. So there's going to be linear elements to it. Um, so like in the fire, you can see that instead of being gradual transitions, there's like bolder red marks and softer red marks, but they're not like gradually faded. Right. And there's not like a wide range of value. There is an attention, a sense of attention to detail. And I would bring you back to this warrior image on the top. Notice all the detail in his armor, but also the muscle definition. Look at that calf, right? It's not overly simplified. There's almost seems an exaggeration of the detail, right? And there's a lot of realistic poses and gestures that tell the story of the war and the warfare. 
So keep in mind, like I said before, um, this really does tell us what warfare is like um, during this time period. We will have another image of warfare when we get to um, Roman escort at the Bayou Tapestry from um, the Normans. And it will be interesting to see some of the similarities and differences of these two images. So here's just some of those details that we were just talking about. It has a sense of accuracy, you know, tells us what the architecture was like during the time period as well. Okay, so that was our image of war and violence. Any questions on that? Um, the presentation is there. So if you need any of the extra information for context about, you know, Minamoto's and Tara's and so on, feel free to put it in. But like I said, I think if you just focus on what the image is about, you'll be okay. I don't think you need a whole lot of background because it is just a single image. Okay, so let's end Japan looking at images of man in the natural world. Um, I do have a few images that aren't part of the two of the 250 and I did this so we have some similarities and things to compare with um, but we talked just a little bit or at least it was on some of the slides about the tales of the Genji and tales of the Genji was written by a woman um, in 978 and this really did help kind of formulate Japanese culture during this time and she wrote about what it would be like or kind of the ideal aspects of a courtier and um, told stories about his romantic liaisons around the capital, but as well as just what like the life of the court should be like. And so it kind of inspired a lot of, of other art, literature, architecture, and kind of the lifestyle of these. Um, and so a lot of the shoguns um, at this time were um, busy trying to accumulate all this power. Um, and we're doing it at the expense of the, the nobles. So they were basically stealing from the nobles. Okay, so um, during this time, we saw this at Rowan, Rowan G. Remember our dry and our wet palace? Um, we have a lot of these beautiful estates. So basically, people who were of royal power, who weren't, you know, shoguns and those kind of like more protective wealthy forces, they created these really kind of beautiful kind of remote, um, I wouldn't say palaces, but they're like estates, right? They're estates. They, they would live in these very um, beautiful areas. And they really were just wealthy, but they didn't have a lot of power. And so a lot of their style was... Um, influenced by these tales of the Genji. So this is the Katsura's Imperial Villas, um, very similar to like Rowanji that we saw, right? So notice how um, nature is incorporated into the architecture, right? Just like Rowanji, and this is maybe some good review for us, notice that the buildings are nestled into the nature. Right, and the nature is very manicured. There's beautiful um, walkways that have been added. It's not like it's just they like walked on the grass and it's all mud. You know, it's manicured. It's got stone. It's got vistas, and so there's reflecting ponds and there's bonsai trees and there's going to be bushes and flowers, and the structures have these really large windows, um, which allow you to see the beautiful landscape that is outside. And then the inside of the houses often have these large screens. And so screens um, typically had paintings on them that were pretty typical of the Japanese style, like what we saw at Rowanji, right? Now, um, I don't want to dwell on this too much because it's not in the 250, but there's a whole series of artists. Um, this is Mushashi, um, and this is called Strike on a Dead Branch. And this really gives you kind of a idea of some of the Japanese aesthetic of this time. Um, Japanese painting is very austere. What do I mean by austere? Does anyone have any clue what I mean by austere? What do I mean by austere? Yeah, it's kind of like very minimal, 
right? There's not a lot of visual information. The interesting thing about Mushashi, um, Mushashi hopefully I'm saying his na name right, he actually was a samurai. He was a samurai who was really good at the sword. And he basically, um, after he kind of did the most he possibly could as a sword maker and a, and a um, samurai, um, he was basically like, what do I have left? So then he decided to move into the arts and um, study art and painting and literature. And so he started to figure, like he, his idea was, how can I use a brush to put as little information on the canvas as possible to convey my meaning. So this bird has very few brush strokes to it. The bamboo or the piece of, um, you know, branch that he's stuck on um, is very, very minimal. Like there's a, not a lot of detail to it, but you get this idea of kind of this peaceful, tranquil um, scene of nature. Right, very calming. And so keep in mind that Japanese style is very, very simple and minimal. So that's going to lead us to um, white and red plum blossoms. We know the name of the artist. This is Orgato Korin. And this is a little bit later. This is from, the se from 1710. This is ink, watercolor, and gold leaf on paper. So by looking at this object painting, right? I, I said it was an object first. Does anyone have any idea what the function of this is? What would this be used for? I have, I have a hint for you. It's just not a simple painting, right? This is a screen. So just like at Rowan G and what we saw there at Castera, um, there's these big, large rooms and they're often divided by these screens or smaller screens. And so can you see how these walls, they would be able to move and close up sections of this space? Um, but there's paintings on those, right? This one is a little bit smaller and it's basically in two parts. And this would be used functionally as a room divider. Right now, the artist had a higher kind of meaning for it, so it's not just a functional piece of art. This also is autobiographical, so this actually tells a story about Corinne. Right, so how is the style of, of white and uh, red blossoms similar to Strike on a Branch? Why did I show you strike on the branch? What is similar about these two pieces? Go ahead and put it in the chat. What's similar? We have some delicate branches, especially on the right side. This is the kind of the cool thing about this painting is it has some different elements on the two sets of screens. So the right screen and the left screen are slightly in a, it's a slightly in a different style. We have minimal details, minimal designs. We have images of nature. That's great too. And then we have contrast between the background and the imagery. Very good. Right. So it has, it's very austere again. It has very minimal um, decoration. So it doesn't have, like here, the paper is the background. Here, the gold leaf is the background, right? But it doesn't have, you know, mountains in the detail or more trees in the background, like some of the Chinese painting that we saw. Right. So I would like everyone to comment in the, the chat for this one. How are these two trees different? How are these two trees different? So we've got the one on the left has a thicker trunk. That's interesting. I never even thought about that before, but it makes sense when we compare the two.
the one on the right seems more upright. That's true, right? Everything kind of shoots up. And the one on the left kind of like shoots down and up. And then we have, we have red leaves and then I think wrote blue leaves, but they're white. It's probably just my screen that is a little off. Based on the name, it's red and white flowers. Good. Okay, so <clears throat> let's focus on the right, the right side. So the red side is the right side, and that has a red plum tree. And Corinne says that that tree represents the toughness, and it represents toughness and youth, right? It tends to show that in his youth, he was very serious, right? And he does that through his straight branches that are kind of shooting up. But notice how thin, right? These are just like little new shoots of branches, right? So he's probably a little naive, right? As a young person, he sees himself kind of as naive, um, a little fresh face, look at all those pretty flowers, life's good, right? And the flowers are very lively and very um, and very positive. So the red plum tree is supposed to mirror the positive side of one's life, right? It reflects him when he was young and when he was bold, right? So remember that this is a self-portrait of an artist as trees. So then the left side, right, the left side is a white plum tree, and this represents him as old. And I think it's funny is that it says old and thin, where you guys talk, the tree branch or the tree trunk is really thick here, but the branches are a lot more angular. You can see kind of like the ups and downs of life here, where it's kind of like zigzagging, almost like lightning bolts across right? However, the flowers are still very calm and delicate and beautiful. So not the tree branches, but the flowers themselves. And supposedly this is supposed to imply his spirit as a mature artist, right? So this is the one tree is his youth, and one tree is his matureness as an artist or an artist of an older age. So as you guys are jotting down those, in the very center of this painting, what do we got? What is that thing in the, in the middle? Go back to the whole thing. What do we have? What is this? We have a stream or a waterway in the center, right? And so that, like when we saw some of the Chinese art, remember that's a path, right? That represents our journey. And so we have gold leaf back here, but supposedly once upon a time, that gold that we see in the water was much more intense. It just faded over time. And so in, I think it's in smart history, um, some images show it as being more gold, others show it as silver, but that shows the flowy water, right? And that represents kind of like the ups and downs and changes of the artist's life. And so we see it really bold and broad. So as, you know, as you're young, you have all these possibilities, right? There's all these options, but then as you see, as it goes back into the distance, um, as one ages, um, you know, your life changes. Maybe you don't have as many options or you pick your choices, right? And you find your path. Right? So the ripples are very soft and gentle. And so um, I, I, I don't think he actually said this. I think this is from smart history. I think they're just thinking that this is possibly, possibly what he said, that like, this is what life, real life is all about. Um, supposedly he drew this really late in his career. Right? 
Um, he was part of a style that we often call the School of Corinne. And so when we call it the School of Corinne, it doesn't mean he went to an art academy and it's called the School of Corinne. Um, this is just a group of artists who typically worked in this similar sort of style. And so it's basically a combination of abstraction. So we've talked about stylization before and stylization basically is abstraction. When you look at it, you're like, oh yeah, that's a tree and that's a river, but I could not swim in this water, right? It doesn't look like realistic water to me, but I know it's water, right? So that's really common of the style, is that there's a sense of abstraction and distortion to it, but also then sometimes there's a high level of detail, such as those branches or those flowers that we see. So here's an example of another screen of a landscape. And here, it's very similar to some of the Chinese artwork that we saw because it's mostly mountains and water or mountains and mist. So you can see the influence of chi Chinese painting on Japanese. Right? So we will later on have the kiss by Gustav Klimt, right? So this image on the top, you've probably seen it a hundred gazillion times. How do you think Klimt was inspired by Corinne? What are some of the similarities that you see? Go ahead and turn on your audio for this one. Who can help me out? Varun, what do you think? Are they similar? Uh, I feel like the image is kind of like has this focus on the path being like the center. Like the kiss also has like the focus of the kiss being in the center of the image. Right. So there's a sense of like symmetrical balance where it's like 50 50 on both sides. That's good. Who, who else has a different one? Cora, do you have one? Um, maybe like the simplicity of the background. Right, so notice how the background of both of them are just gold. Anything else? I would say the use of gold, right? The use of gold. Isn't there a good blending of realism and abstraction? Notice the faces on the Klimt are super, super realistic, at least hers is, but then their bodies are not realistic at all, right? And this actually takes place on a hillside. I don't think a lot of people notice this. This is like a, a hill that's covered in wildflowers. So kind of similar to the flowers that you see um, on the trees. Okay, let's go ahead and finish up Japan. Thanks again. Um, go ahead and turn on your cameras to let me know you're here. If you wouldn't mind, I appreciate that. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Okay, so our last piece, um, you probably know it as the great wave of um, Kanjogawa. Right? So this style is a um, Yokoyi um, print, right? And so in the, the information on this image, it tells you that it is a woodblock print, right? So a woodblock print. And these were really typical of um, Japanese printing from this time period. And the term um, yiko, yiko yi means the floating world. And it's not like here we have an image of water, but it really isn't about that. It's Buddhist concept of the impermanence of the world. And so this was a very common theme in a lot of the paintings, um, or excuse me, in a lot of the prints. And this style of print became really popular, became a major fad in the late 1800s in Europe. And so a lot of the Impressionist artists were very much inspired by this style of art. So we will see this um, I'll show you a few examples and then we'll see it again when we get to Impressionism. Um, one of the reasons why Jap Japanese art was so um, sought after is that really, other than the influence from mainline Asia into Japan, Japan has traditionally been a very like closed off place, right? It's obviously a series of islands 
but also um, it's always kind of kept to itself with its own sort of um, style and power structure. And so it wasn't until the 1850s where it, they started to have open trade, especially with like the New World. So like the Americas with um, maybe you've heard of like Commodore Perry, right, where he went and um, traded with Japan. But others traded with them too in the 1600s, like the Dutch. Right. So this kind of gives you a little bit of context of how it became popular. So in 1867, in um, the International, International Exhibition in Paris, this was basically where artists from around the world, as well as um, culture from around the world, um, would go. It's kind of like a world's fair for art, would go um, to kind of see art. And so the Japanese pavilion had um, this, it was all dedicated to Hokusai. So that's the artist um, that we have for the Great Wave. And um, like I said, a lot of artists were inspired. So this actually is a painting um, or a print, excuse me, this left side is a pr print by another artist named Hiroji. And then this painting on the right is by Van Gogh, right? So you know Van Gogh with the sunflowers and the starry night. And so the style typically has kind of a flattening of space, um, kind of a uh, minimal sort of element to it. So here's some of the other artists that were inspired by Japanese um, painting or prints. So like this is Mary Cassatt. Um, she did a lot of uh, prints. So like the stripes on the mother's clothing or the aerial view, remember this like bird's eye view of looking down, but also just images of bathers in general was really common in Japanese prints. The, the linear quality that we see here on the Toulouse-Lautrec in the middle, and then like the patterning that we saw of Klimt with the use of gold, All right? So here's a little bit of info on the form. Um, so form, a wood cut is in essence what we call a relief print. So make sure that you have this vocabulary down. A relief print is basically a print that's made from a raised image. So you basically take a block of wood, right? And you carve away everything that you don't want to be detailed. That's basically the opposite of almost all other kinds of printmaking. Normally printmaking, you, you draw in the detail, but with woodcut, or relief printing, you carve away everything that is not the detail. And so what it leaves is it leaves a raised image that becomes the printed image. And when Hokosai was doing this, he basically had one block per color. So it's not like he took the same block and printed a bunch of colors and then carved more and printed more. He had to have it done really precisely where each of them lined up perfectly. And so he printed all the different colors that we see in the, the final image. So here's a good illustration of those different blocks. And so the style of a woodcut isn't really modeled. Like there's not gonna be a lot of like value changes because you're basically printing flat ink and flat colors. So it tends to have linear qualities to it, right? So um, Hokusai did a series of prints. Does anyone know what the function of these prints were, were, were? Like, why were they made? Does anyone know? These were actually printed for tourists, right? These are souvenirs. So basically, Hokusai made 36 six prints based on Mount Fuji. So Mount Fuji is a sacred volcano, a sacred mountain in Japan. And we have three of his artworks here. And each of them, if you look into the distance, you can see Mount Fuji. Um, obviously this one is all about Mount Fuji, but in every one of these paintings, even if it looks like it's about a little countryside village or town or farmers, you're always going to see Mount Fuji there because it is, you know, permanent, right? It's a god, it was actually revered as a god. 
right? So here's some more examples of Mount Fuji hanging out while all the Japanese enjoy their beautiful landscape and natural surroundings, their quiet vi villages, and so on. Right? So why is Mount Fuji so important? It's the highest mountain in Japan. It's considered sacred, right? Um, Hokusai was responding to a boom in domestic travel. So it wasn't that this was a world destination. This was a destination for other Japanese um, tourists. And so basically people would go on pilgrimages to follow the cult of Fuji. And so when you would go to um, Mount Fuji, you would want to buy souvenirs. And so this happens to be one of the types of souvenirs that people would buy um, when they made the journey there. So people would climb the mountain and so on, right? So let's look at how he creates space. So space would be visual depth. Let's look first at just the one at the top that's in our, in our image set. Right? How does he create space? Anyone? You can throw it in the chat if you like. He tends to overlap the space, right? So what we have is a series of large waves and boats that layer back into space. And sometimes it gets a little bit smaller as it moves back into the distance. But he too um, was really inspired by art of Europe. And because of Dutch trade, he knew of things like linear perspective. So he was actually one of the first Japanese artists to try to make things look like they're going back into the distance in a much more realistic way. So in this scene at the very bottom here, we can see um, details kind of angling back for the architecture. That's not necessarily evident in our image set though, or the one that's in our image, right? So what's happening? This is de depicting a large wave. This could be like a tsunami wave. So it's a really large wave. And you can see when you look really closely, you can see that there are three boats kind of caught up into this big giant rogue wave, right? But then we have the rather peaceful Mount Fuji in the background. So it kind of has a calming effect to it, right? So what's the focal point? Where is the, what is the most important area in this print. What do you think? Where does your eye go? Go ahead and throw it in the chat for me. Let's see how many responses I can get. Where does your eye go? Okay. So I've gotten a couple of mixed results here, but pretty much the same. Got a lot of people who say this largest wave. Some people said Mount Fuji. Can you see how um, Hokosai really intentionally arranged the composition to force us to look at Mount Fuji, right? Notice how the movement, it goes from the right and it spirals with the ships, right? With the little fishing boats and then that large wave and the crest of it points us back to that serene image of Mount Fuji. So he really does manipulate the viewer to look in that spiral and then for our attention to be in this kind of blank space here between the rogue, right, wave and Mount Fuji. Right? So we just kind of talked about that, right? So um, if you're really interested in this print, um, I would recommend going to the art assignment here. The art assignment is by Rachel Urist. That's the wife of John Green. Um, she has her own YouTube channel, which we'll look at occasionally. Um, there's about a 10 minute video on the Great Wave and why it's so important and so on. So feel free to go ahead and look at that. Um, what I wanted to do was to remind you um, that the stupa of Sanchi will be in the next unit. So feel, don't feel like you have to fill in a bunch of notes for this piece. We will study it hopefully before winter break. 
Um, but we'll study this when we look at pilgrimages. We'll do a comparison with a Romanesque church, and then we'll do um, a research assignment on that. Um, so don't worry about that. But keep in mind for the quiz for Thursday, we need to know the basic basis basic, excuse me the basic um, of these different religions and beliefs that we've talked about. So you don't need to know everything about Buddhism or Hinduism, but please make sure that you know how the religion influenced the design and decoration of the temples, of the stupas, of the sacred objects that we've looked at, right? Um, we did a lot of imagery based on images of power. So we saw images from Chinese art, Korean, and Japanese. Um, you'd want to know some of the influences in Neo-Confucianism and Taoism on art. Um, you'd want to be able to uh, compare and contrast the styles of painting. Uh, we've seen Chinese painting, Korean painting, Japanese painting. Um, we have, of course, got our Japanese print from today. Um, we'd want to be able to see the influence of the Silk Road because we've talked about that several times as well. Um, and with the trade. And then we've also seen some art from the illiterati um, and other sort of like government sanctions art styles. We saw that in Korea. We saw that with the Mao image um, and so on. So you probably want to know, may, be able to make the connections with that. Um, because of getting kicked off, and I want to thank you guys for sticking with me, um, I d we probably don't have a lot of time, but I did throw in a couple of cahoots that I found for you guys, too, if you want to do any of that sort of review. Um, I don't think we need to do that right now unless you guys really want to. So if you want to do the cahoot, um, we could. You can, like, um, say if you really want to in the um, chat. Um, but I want to give you a few moments to ask questions if you have any. You guys okay? I'll post today's recording. Um, I'll compile it in just a little bit and I'll post it um, in case you lost connection or something happened. Hopefully that first half of the video saved fine. Um, I saw that it saved, but obviously I haven't been able to preview it. Any questions, concerns? You guys all okay? No one wants to play Kahoot, looks like. We're all okay? Okay, so I will see you guys bright and early on Thursday, right? Don't forget, North people, get out a funky mug, right? Mug day, I guess. Central, what is, do you guys have a dress up day? No? Dress up week? It's pajama day. It's pajama day. We had pajama day yesterday when we were like off screen, which I thought was funny. Well, enjoy it, right? I'll see you guys uh, on Thursday then. Bye-bye.